Episode 15, 2014. Part 1. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. Where else would you rather be than right here, right now? Now, on Inside the Buffalo... Wait! Wait, wait, wait. Can't use that title. How about... This! All right! Folks, welcome to another episode of Down and Drought as we walk through every season of the Bills' 17-year playoff absence. We have only three episodes left until we get to 2017. I'm Prescott Rossi. He's Thad Brown. Joining us this week, special guest from the Syracuse Post-Standard, Mr. Matthew Fairburn. Matt, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I've been following along for these... Uh terrible terrible years <laughs> of football but uh entertaining episodes and happy to be here to relive a couple of interesting years and as we enter uh 2014 where are you in your career uh as i know you come to, to syracuse into western new york where were you at this point at the start yeah at the start of 2014 i was still at the university of missouri uh finishing up covering their run to the cotton bowl and so <laughs> i was pretty out of touch with i guess what was going on in the early part of that year wasn't until I graduated and about a month later that I, I jumped onto the beat. And by the time I had jumped on, it was already a whirlwind. Things were, were taken off and there was a lot of news. And so I had to hit the ground running and it didn't stop. It pretty much still has. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah. The, the, the roller coaster ride has continued from pretty much the start of January all the way through to today. And just a little peek behind the curtain. You know, I've been looking at these uh, legal pads through every one of these episodes. I usually do about six, seven pages of research. 2014 has 13 pages. This is, without fail, the busiest year of the Bills playoff drought. So no time to waste. In fact, we're going to fast forward all the way into March. Yes, the Bills have hired Jim Schwartz. And yes, Andre Reid is elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But we'll talk about that later. Because on March 5th, the Bills and Rogers Media announced that there will be no Toronto game in 2014. Now, I know, Matt, you hadn't covered a Toronto game, but Thad, you had been there for the previous ones. Mm -hmm. And the news that the Toronto series looks like it's on the way out. Everybody was happy about it. I mean, top to bottom, not just, you know, fans excited about the Bills won't play in Toronto. They won't lose another home game. They won't go to a place where they were one and five. The media loved it because we hated driving up there. There was nothing <laughs> good about it. The, the facility was terrible. The parking was terrible. You know, the whole atmosphere was just bad for pro football. So to get that out, and not only, you know, the, at the time was announced as a one-year absence, it certainly had all the hallmarks of one year, meaning all the years, and yeah. that was never coming back. So it was, you know, a great way to start the offseason for the Bills. The Toronto series is uh, under contract through 2017, and we've mentioned this in prior episodes of just the fact that we could still be talking about yes, the Toronto series this year had they not canceled uh, all the way back at the start of 2014. Uh, the month of March may be the most tumultuous month in the history of the Buffalo Bills. Friday, March 14th. Uh, Erie County Medical Center releases a statement that Jim Kelly's cancer returned. And that was a storyline from the 2013 year. It, it, he had beaten cancer, it was in remission, but to see it come back again. And I remember this distinctly, that feeling of just, oh no. Mm -hmm. And that's how everybody thought. You yeah. know, the, we, the, we thought Jim Kelly had it beat. And, you know, but with cancer, everybody knows how it goes. Yeah. So this is definitely a distinct possibility. And there was always a concern, especially in the first few months it could happen. And it got Western New York concerned again, because as we've talked about, Jim Kelly had moved beyond being just a football hero. He was a guide, he was an educator, he was an example. He was so much more to the community. And the community reacted in kind to you know, news that their mentor, the Buffalo mentor, now was again having to deal with cancer. Yeah, I remember when I got here and that was still such a big story. And one of the first things I covered was his football camp. And he uh, gave the speech to open it up. He actually managed to get there. and. He moved the crowd, a lot of the people, to tears. I mean, just with you know his passion and the fact that he was able to muster the energy to go and coach these kids for a couple of days. And everybody, I remember just being there, still so concerned about him at that point months later. And it's something that finally people aren't as concerned about, but yeah. it was definitely a scary summer for him. Yeah, it, it, it's you know just a blessing that you can look back and smile. You, know, you look at Jim Kelly and smile, and you know he's 
he's everywhere. You know, he's mm -hmm. the Jim Kelly. Uh, you know, he's lost weight, obviously, but, uh, you know, he's back. And, uh, Matt, you're a couple years younger than I am, but I remember watching Jim Kelly play. What, what were your memories of Jim Kelly like growing up and then, you know, moving into covering the team and living in Western New York? Yeah, a lot of it is you hear about on the outside, obviously, the four Super Bowls, but I remember him, you know, being the USFL guy and, and having that whole yeah. drama. That was, you know, what I knew him as. Uh, before I got here and obviously the four Super Bowls and his great career that high-powered offense and and you hear all about it but I don't think you can really appreciate Jim Kelly until you get here and you see what happens when he walks into a room anywhere in Western New York I mean people just light up and are glued to him wherever he goes and I, I don't think I quite understood what he meant to the community and, until I got here. Yeah, it really is something when you witness it firsthand, mm -hmm. just the way he overpowers the room. You, you, you walks and you go, oh, there's Jim Kelly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're in the media, you, you don't get starstruck, but it, you know when Jim Kelly is around, and whether it's a training camp on the sidelines before a game, or, you know, at a dinner, and you know when Jim Kelly is there. My first ever News 8 interview. This is before, because I've done two different stints here, one in sports, one in news. Then before that as an intern, my first interview as an intern at News 8 was Jim Kelly. Could not have been more cordial. Could not have been more cordial. <laughs> uh, and, and there you go. Well, the 2014, when his cancer returns, I remember the, the feeling was clearly different from 2013, where it was, yes, he has this cancer in his sinuses and his jawbone, but he's going to have surgery, and it looks like this is going to be treatable. But 2014 had a different vibe. Um, Monday, March 24th, 10 days after the news that the cancer returned, Jill Kelly uh, puts on Instagram and on Twitter that the cancer is spread outside his jaw and is aggressive. And, you know, obviously cancer it touches everybody in a different way. And just to, to hear that news, you go, oh, this is, this is much more serious than he has, needs an operation and this is something that we can treat. Well, for, of course, the first time he gets cancer, he beats it, sometimes that's it. You, know, you hope yeah. that's the end of the deal. But when it comes back, you know, then you start to wonder if his body will have enough to overcome. And obviously when it spreads, it makes it worse. I think the other part of it too is, I felt like this one was followed more. There were the pictures from the hospital. Sure. You know, I think people were more involved in not only the day-to-day, -day, but almost the hour-by-hour -hour updates with Kelly, which made it a little more visceral and right there for you to follow. Tonight, there's news that fans of Buffalo Bills Hall of Fame quarterback Jim Kelly didn't want to hear. He is in tough shape and in New York City for another cancer surgery. Through Instagram, Jill Kelly announced her husband will undergo surgery this Thursday. We've learned he's already been flown to Lenox Hill Hospital in Manhattan. The Hall of Fame quarterback is said to be weak and in bad shape. Yesterday, Jill Kelly posted a photo of the family in the hospital watching online the Sunday service at the chapel at Cross Point. No, he was not as comfortable with that at first, but his wife and his daughters really wanted to share his journey so that he could have the whole community behind him. And, you know, in retrospect, he said it was the right decision. It helped having all those prayers and all that and all the support as he was trying to fight through that. Jill Kelly wrote last Friday that her husband's cancer is aggressive and spreading. On a scale of 1 to 10, his friend Dennis DiPaolo described Kelly's pain as a 10, tremendous pain, he called it. Jill Kelly also posted this photo last week of her daughter, saying sometimes this is the best medicine. Daddy loves you so much. Jim Kelly had part of his jaw and teeth removed last June when his oral cancer was found. But it was 12 days ago that a return visit found the cancer had returned. Well, that was on Monday, March 24th, the very next day, March 25th, Tuesday, remember well, uh, Ralph Wilson dies at 95. This is breaking news from News 8. We do have breaking news at this hour. Buffalo Bills owner Ralph Wilson has died. He was 95 years old. Sports director John Kutchko got to know him over the years and joins us now. Yeah, Rachel, the Bills patriarch had been in declining health, hadn't attended a Bills game in two seasons. Team president and CEO Russ Brandon confirming today that Ralph Wilson indeed has died. I, I happen to be off that day working here at News 8 and uh, seeing that news that Russ Brandon announces at the the owners meetings in Orlando that uh, that Ralph has passed away the uh, the weird part about that day for me is that it started out with a story about the reconfiguration the uh, renovation of what would become New Era Field at that time yeah. Ralph Wilson Stadium and I spent the whole morning going through all the different staircases and concession stands and all the little things that were absolutely minutiae by the afternoon 
So I do this whole story that in the morning in Buffalo, stand-ups, ready to come back. That was going to be the big thing for the day. And as I'm pulling into the station here, that's when I heard the news on the radio that Ralph had passed. And obviously, yeah. th that story Jeez. never, ever made air. No yeah. one ever saw it. It never existed. <laughs> With a $25,000 franchise fee and a dream, Ralph Wilson became owner of the Buffalo Bills in 1959. His AFL team began play in 1960, and the rest was history. A merger into the NFL followed that and five decades of memories. Are you ready? 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 Wilson was a player's owner, treating them like his own kids. After years of losing football, he brought a winner to Western New York, four straight trips to the Super Bowl. For Ralph Wilson, pro football was more than a business. It was a way of life. You have to have an owner that has a passion for the game. Don't come in as an investment. Have a passion for pro football, which I am. If you want to make a fortune, you either have to in football, you have to sell or die. And I'm not interested in either one of those. Oh, hey, Mr. Wilson. How are you? Good to see you. The Bills owner was always present at practice, at camp, at every game. It's all he knew. They gave me the game ball, <laughs> which is really an honor. and. Uh, here, I'll show it to you. <laughs> he was an old style owner who lived for his team and his team lived for him. A throwback to the golden era of sports. I'll tell you one thing, I've had a lot of fun and with, this, with this franchise. You know, it's, it's really been uh, half, half my life, half my life has been spent here with the franchise and I have had a lot of fun. Ralph Wilson was 95. The legacy he leaves behind, immeasurable. Uh, from a national perspective, I mean, obviously, Ralph meant so much to the franchise and to the league. But then, you know, the way the news cycle works is you immediately think, well, what does this mean for the Bills? And yeah. I think that's where everybody's mind went in the following weeks was, where's this franchise going to be? Uh, you know, who's going to buy the team? Is it going to be stable? And that is sort of the underappreciated part of Ralph Wilson is that you just always knew the team would be here when, when he was here, but once he was gone, I think a lot of people became pretty uncomfortable. 30 years from now, I want you to look down the road. And 30 years 30 from years now, from come now, on. I want Ralph come C. On. Wilson here to give me a biographical sketch of the type of owner or type of person he wants running the football team that he founded. Well, I don't know. Uh, the um, I hope it's one that, uh, an owner that that has a s stabilization in mind that you know uh, tries to keep a franchise for the fans. Uh, you know where it's been, which I always have been. You know I've been for you know against relocation um, and. Um, to do the best job, to you know, uh, to feel a, a good team, because this is not a to have a passion for the game. That's the most important. This is not a money-making thing. F although when I know when they see seventy-seven thousand fans, Jesus, that Wilson is really coining money. Or the TV contract. Or the TV contract. Or does he make an a fortune? Uh, it's not that at all. If you want to make a fortune, you either have to, in football, you have to sell or die. And I'm not interested in either one of those. You know, as we've gone over these last 14, now 15 seasons, um, you know, we've talked about Ralph in ways that were not great. You know, he did mm -hmm. things that are part of the reason why we're doing this series to begin with. Um, I, you know, I've had the, the long felt feeling that the drought exists mainly because of Ralph Wilson, but at the same time, you know, it's not just a black or white thing with Ralph. He, you know, leaves the, the, the final lease with the $400 million out clause, kind of like a going away present from Ralph that keeps the bills in Western New York at least till 2020. Um, you know, just Thad, your, your feelings on Ralph and what he meant 
to me, I think it's a bit more conflicted, but maybe you're more one way or the other. It's, it's funny because if you only grew up in Buffalo, if you're maybe below 30 years old, like you, I am. You, you, only remember, you only remember the drought and, yeah. and the failures that you are right are in large part attributable to Ralph Wilson. But, as, you know, I'm, I'm 40, so I grew up in this you're era. You're a man. That's right. I'm 40. <laughs> um, I was in high school for the four years of the Bills Super Bowl year, so I remember all that joy and all that happiness. And, yeah, they all ended up in a loss in the Super Bowl, but – Boy, the Bills were the thing, not just mm -hmm. Western New York and everywhere, but everywhere else. And Western New York appreciated the fact that it was everywhere else. And that was a part of it, too. And I think, you know, even though at that point, Bills fans had dealt with a decade and a half of terrible football, when he passes, you know, there's the Bills Mafia um, party, almost, you yeah. know, a tailgate to remember Ralph. And, and it was more a celebration than it was, you know, in the end of an angry era. And I think that's how a lot of people in Buffalo will end up remembering Ralph. There was dancing and cheering. Let's go, Buffalo! Let's go. And hot dogs. And of course, Buffalo Wings! A perfect way for Bills fans to pay tribute to their late patriarch. We're honoring Mr. Wilson the best way we know how, and that's with a tailgate. The team's top fan group, Bills Mafia, announced plans for today's event on Tuesday. And the response was so overwhelming, they had to move from their normal tailgating lot to one ten times as big. It just seemed like this was the, the way to do it. Let's let's celebrate it. You know what I mean? He lived a great life and he has quite a legacy and let's 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 remember it that way. Several hundred Bills fans attended, including some from Rochester, Canada, and New York City. For the last 54 years, Ralph has been everything to this community. And so if we just all get together, everyone's talking about Ralph in between our hamburgers and other festivities and uh, He'd probably appreciate that. Bill's president and CEO Russ Brandon stopped by. He said Mr. Wilson always revered the passion of Bill's fans. You guys are the ones that have got us through this over the last few days. He would have loved being out here with everybody. He always, he always enjoyed coming in and seeing the tailgating. Our fans are incredible. They're passionate. And it was fun to spend a little time with everybody. And, and uh, it was very therapeutic, to be quite frank. Not only is today about remembering Ralph Wilson, it's also about supporting Jim Kelly. Every car parked here donated at least $10. That plus 10% of the food sales all go to Jim Kelly's foundation, Hunter's Hope. It's been a rough week. But, you know, and not to sound, you know, trite, but I mean, th that saying, nobody circles the wagons, I mean, that's what we're doing here. We're circling the wagons. Something you take for granted that even though this team is losing year after year, and like you said, you could trace a lot of that back to Ralph, the team was there uh, in yeah. Buffalo, and you had those. Uh, the team might not have ever been in Buffalo to begin with, if not for Ralph Wilson. And so, uh, you know, he, the league owes a lot to him. Buffalo owes a tremendous amount to him, and I, I think... People have appreciated that more and more because you're right, right in the moment, you know, and as the, the bad years are unfolding, you can, it's easy to point to ownership and, you know, blame them for everything that's going on. But at the same time, it's not bad to have a pro franchise in your city. And yeah. uh, without Ralph, that might not have been the case. And, and not to mention also just the, the philanthropic gestures he mm -hmm. did over his lifetime, you know, millions of dollars and you see it all over, yeah. not only Buffalo, but Rochester as well, things named after Ralph Wilson. Still doing it. The, the Ralph yeah. Wilson Endowment Fund has now uh, spent $5 million in Rochester on youth sports. So it, it is still happening today. Yeah, I mean, the Ralph Wilson Foundation gets a, a nice boost of cash coming uh, from the Pula yes. family yeah, sure, in yeah. due time. But, uh, yeah, so, uh, so Ralph passes on March 25th. The next day, March 26th, Jill Kelly reveals that Jim will not have surgery. He needs chemotherapy and radiation. So I, I just remember thinking... Geez, you know, the, the dark cloud was as thick as it's ever yeah, been. I mean, the, you, you, you know, have the owner, the founder of the team passing away mm -hmm. and its greatest player full stop. Who knows how bad he is, but it does not sound good when you hear chemotherapy and radiation. And when you say dark cloud, you know, we, we've joked a little bit about the dark cloud when it comes to six and ten and or you know, Toronto. not making playoffs. Exactly. Yeah. And this was a dark cloud about, you know, the passing of an owner and, and maybe the imminent passing of its greatest hero. And that's what it, it felt like yeah. then. That It was just a dark period to be someone who supported, followed, or covered the Bills. Yeah, I remember when I got here thinking about all that the team had been through. You know, you, the Bills don't register a lot unless you're local. And when you're there, you start to see, like, man, the owner is gone. And the team is, you know, the fans are just hanging on every update about Jim, every update from his wife and his daughters. And, and oh, by the way, the team isn't very good. You know, yeah. they're fighting off. You know, they got E.J. Manuel as their quarterback, Doug Marone back for a second year. I mean, it just, you know, showing up to camp, it was like, man, this is a, 
a tough team to root for, but then you see the stands at St. John Fisher are still full and it's like, it's a unique uh, kind of give and take that, that this city and this region has with this team. And I don't think there's any better example of it than that summer when so much was going wrong and yet everybody just wanted to show up and, and watch Bill's football. Still. Yeah, uh, and uh, March 26th, on a personal note, is uh, the day my father goes into hospice, and he would pass away a couple days later on the 29th, and I just remember that week just being a blur. I don't really remember, I remember, but I don't really remember, and um, you know, to speak to the point of, about the Kelly family posting pictures and going through Jim in the hospital, and. I look at my father in his own deathbed and look at Jim, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I just remember feeling really uncomfortable about the Kellys posting those pictures because, you know, I wanted my father to die with dignity and to pass away, you know, comfortably. And so, you know, to have a cell phone in, in, in Jim's face rubbed me the wrong way. I understood why it was valuable. And, you know, maybe I'm looking at it from a unique perspective because I'm going through my own kind of nightmare in a way. But I remember that was my feeling was I just wanted them to like, just, just, you can issue a like, hey, Jim's going through this, he's doing well. I didn't, I felt really uncomfortable seeing pictures of Jim, you know, lying there looking, you know, frail and, you know, pale as a ghost. It, if something, you, I understand the, the need to back off. And yeah. when you said unique perspective, that's what I thought of. There's no, I can't speak to this. Yeah. You know, this is something that only you could have understood. I think from someone who covered it, you know, and that's covered it. it, 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 it yeah. I, I also felt that it interfered, maybe not interfered, but played into how I covered it because in the back of my mind, I'm saying like, no, put that phone away. Yeah. Please just do that because I, I don't know. I didn't want it. I, it felt, I felt maybe uh, slimy is the wrong word, but like I felt uneasy about mm -hmm. it. That's and, a good way to put and it. That's, and so throughout this Kelly ordeal, I, I understand that it's a selfish way to look at it, but I felt my own personal connection to watching someone pass away and go through this, that I was just, I didn't like it at all. The one thing I'll say to that is, without having that perspective, to me, all the updates and having the phone in the face, because I would have thought the same thing about you, about someone who was passing away. All those updates to me kind of made it feel like it wasn't that bad. That, mm. you know, he wouldn't have allowed this. They wouldn't be doing this if they yeah, thought he was be, within that, that hours of dying. True. You know, and whether, whether it was true or not, yeah. Everybody in Western New York, I wonder how many other people thought the same thing as me. Yeah, it very well could be true. I think initially, and maybe even for a while during it, Jim didn't much care for it either. Oh, yeah. And yeah. he had, he's voiced that. And he came around and, you know, afterwards, you know, realized that all that love and support was worth it. But to your point, I mean, it, it was a bit much at times yeah. when you're like, man. Uh, but it's like you said, part of me wanted to think, all right, maybe this means it's not that bad. The other part of me is like, what's the next picture going to be? Yeah. yeah. And you don't want to. You know, wanna... you see that picture of, uh, you know, a child, a kid or a parent or whatever, like holding his hand and you only see, you know, like, because I, I have that picture of my own father, of my hand holding his hand. And I know my dad is slipping in and out of consciousness. So I know that like, you know, I'm not going to take a picture of my dad lying in his deathbed, but you know, you see that picture and like that gave me solace. And to your point, if I see a picture of, you know, just Jim Kelly's hand, in Jill Kelly's hand or something, they're like, she's, you know, God knows what the next couple of days are going to be like. Yeah, it gives you an uneasy feeling, you know, yeah. refreshing the feed and, and seeing what, you know, Jill tweets out. It, it, it may have set some people at ease. It probably made a lot of people even all the more nervous because Jim did not look good. Mm -hmm. No, he I remember that pounds, the yeah. first time I, you know, m met him thinking like, man, like he looks 20, 30 years older. Than he is, and he, you know, he didn't look good, and that's what made I think those photos even more jarring. And we covered that like a game. I mean, that right. every update was top of the, the newscast yeah. news. I mean, how is he doing today? What's going on? Is it, is it chemo today? Is he doing okay? Does he feel like he wants to, you know, talk or anything? Everything that had happened was important news that we had to cover because our viewers and readers and everything else were, were paying attention. So I picked that scab off. Thursday, April 3rd, Bills announced that Mary Wilson is the controlling owner. The team is in a trust. The move helps facilitate a sale. And uh, our, our dear friend, Mr. Tim Graham from the Buffalo News, reports that the sale is further along than many expect, and Evoke could come as soon as October. And, you know, the, the dark cloud of relocation, whether it be Toronto, Los Angeles, who knows where else, the moon, um, but uh, <laughs> of just that, that like, oh, if this is moving along quickly, I remember feeling like that could be a good sign yeah. 
if the sale's going to go quickly. I, what, do you, what do you remember from the, that? Looking back on it and reviewing for this, you know, the, I never really was, I was probably more nervous before Ralph passed at different times when the Toronto series began yeah. than I think I ever was during the sale process. Because right off the bat, it seemed like everything was pointing towards the Bill Stang. And the lease was a part of that too. The parting gift, I think was, I don't know, a big factor, but a factor. But it, you know, the, the whole idea of them moving somewhere else, LA was really never discussed. And the Toronto thing was kind of a joke because it was the John Bon Jovi group. And every time you talked about that group, it always came with, hey, did you hear what random Bill's organization didn't want to play John Bon Jovi music in there? Yeah. It was kind of like silly yeah. to where you weren't really worried about, oh, this might legitimately become where the Bills play. Yeah, it was, that sale was so interesting because even though people were nervous, like you said, it never felt like they had to be. It was almost like a reality show unfolding with especially because of the characters that jumped into the mix bon jovi <laughs> yes. donald trump and meanwhile the whole time it was probably it was all steering in one direction for the most part with little sideshows popping up here and there as you can expect when an nfl team pops up for sale but it, it got it got weird during the it summer it sure right. did <laughs> it sure did thursday april 10th john crick of the toronto sun who uh, was uh, a must read throughout the sale process for the Toronto perspective. Uh, reports that John Bon Jovi is indeed part of a group expecting to bid on the bills and uh, with Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment being the strongest link. But Crick, to his credit, also explained it in ways that really proved that the Toronto series never really got off the ground. And even right from the beginning in April, he's pointing out facts that the NFL prohibits co corporate ownership. So it has to be an individual that's fronting mm -hmm. Uh, the, the group that's purchasing or bidding on the bills. So, okay, if, is John Bon Jovi going to be the focal point? Well, Bon Jovi only wants to be the focal point, but he only has $300 million, right. and the controlling owner, and I we know we're getting a little wonky here, but the controlling owner um, has to have at least 30% stake in the team. If the sale of the bills is a billion dollars, do the math in your head, yeah, it's not that's, yeah. that's $300 million for 30%, yeah. and that's every dollar that John Bon Jovi has. <laughs> right. So if Bon Jovi doesn't want to be the, uh, the number two or some part of a minority owner, well, then he's out. That's $300 million out. And now there are others in Toronto that have billions of dollars that could purchase the bills. But Bon Jovi, even right in the beginning of April, you kind of get the sense that, okay, yeah, he's interested. We're all interested. We'd That'd be fun <laughs> right. to be an NFL owner. But the reality isn't there for, for John Bon Jovi. Just like you and me. He didn't have enough money. Yeah. I mean, he was closer than you and me were. But the that, cost that, is too damn that high. That was it. That was it. I mean, and you know, the the way you were saying it, you needed an individual. He was working with corporates. He was working with Rogers Communications and, and the other group of MLSC, whatever. yeah. That's what it was, yeah. So at the end of the day, he just didn't have the money. And like we were saying, you knew this right from the start. Didn't he try to get the Kellys involved that came later, later on? We in sure the process. Did. Yeah. And he that was all the drama. I feel like centered around him because he was the one person everybody was worried about moving the team as much as he insisted he would not. Nobody really bought it. Yeah. And I still remember that fan group that popped up, Bill's Fan Thunder, that <laughs> located uh, the document. Yeah, yeah. That has like a, they have a weird backstory in, in and of themselves, but they were just so passionate and like really aggressive with their PR outreach. I went to a few of their events and it's like Bon Jovi became poison mm -hmm. in Buffalo. Nobody would listen to it and all this stuff and all just because of a narrative that got, kept getting spun by a couple of fan groups and all of a sudden it was like nobody wanted Bon Jovi. Bon well, and that was the thing was, you know, because Toronto obviously looms not only because of its location and the Toronto series as well, you know, people I think were looking for someone to point like, there's the guy, that's the enemy. He became the villain. And yeah. it was so easy because everybody knows who John Bon Jovi is. Well, there's another enemy that pops up and, uh, well, maybe enemy to some. Um, and we've talked about in Down and Drought, what ifs, what if moments. What if the Bills don't beat the Jets late in 2001? That leads to the Patriots having the tuck rule game. What if? The Bills didn't trade for J.P. Lossman. Would they have drafted Aaron Rodgers the following year? And, of course, the other draft picks, Haloti Nada, that they passed on for Dante Whitner and Rob Gronkowski and, and Russell Wilson. Well, Monday, April 14th, the biggest what if to impact not only the Bills, not only Western New York, but the whole freaking world as Donald Trump <laughs> declares interest in buying the Buffalo Bills. Uh, says in an interview with Tim Graham, if I can do it, 
I am keeping the Bills in Buffalo. Man, have things changed over the last three years, but um, the fact that Donald J. Trump is throwing his hat into the ring to purchase the Bills. Before Terry Pagula was alive, I thought he was actually one of the best candidates to buy the Bills in terms of he would have plenty of funds, he would be want to be number so one. He says. Yeah, that's what he says. <laughs> right, right. Um, he, you know, he said he would keep the Bills in Buffalo. I, I generally believed it. A lot more than John Bon Jovi for sure. But yeah, and uh, there's another point, and I don't know if you're going to get to this at all, but um, Trump talks about how uh, there's a tweet. He has a tweet, shockingly, yeah, no, right. where he says, I'm the only bidder that is going to keep the Bills in Western New York. And this is later, later on in the process. Yeah. I'm like, where have I seen this before? This looks so <laughs> familiar, you know? Donald Trump showing more interest about buying the Bills today. Sports director John Kutzko is here to tell us what's up with Trump. Yeah, word of this started to emerge, Kev, about two weeks ago, and now it's growing even more so. Donald Trump tells Buffalo News sports writer Tim Graham that he has had multiple discussions with the Bills about potential potentially buying the football team. In fact, he says he would sell his casino interests if it meant he could get the Bills. Now, Trump's name has been linked to the franchise the last couple of weeks. The Bills are in the process of determining a value for the team believed to be north of $870 million. They could approach the billion-dollar mark. Trump had a short-lived foray into the now-defunct USFL in the mid-1980s. He briefly owned the New Jersey Generals. That league would soon fold because of antitrust laws. Now, I can tell you this, Trump also said he's got a 757 in from New York to Buffalo. It would take him about an hour to get from New York City to prior aviation, the private airstrip in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. He wants to keep the team in the region. For Bills fans, we hope it's not bluster. This could be a very, very good See, thing. That's the thing with Trump. He, he talks a big story about a lot of things. In this interview he did with Tim Graham, a guy that I know and respect a lot from the Buffalo News, he said this is not the kind of bluster that may have been linked to him in the past. Okay. It's encouraging. Thanks, John. Okay. And later on, he actually said, he was quoted as saying he never even would have thought of running for president or any of that if he had won the bid. Yeah. If he was an NFL owner, that was sort of, and some people think that that is still his end game. To like he, he still wants yeah. to be an NFL owner, like, because he still would have to get approval and there's no guarantee that he would. And so that's like a seat at a table that he's not allowed at mm -hmm. that he really, really wants. Yeah. And so he had said if he had won the bid and he bought the bills, that was like it. Like that was what he wanted. And he wouldn't have done politics or any of that. So it's, you want to talk about a what if. I yeah. mean, that is. And the other what if is like, oh, my God, what would have become of the team? Yeah. Like, yes. who knows? I mean, like you said, he probably would have kept them in Buffalo, but maybe he would have woke up one day and decided, <laughs> exactly you know, a team would LA look looks pretty good, good in China. <laughs> like, yes, who knows? Yes. And, uh, you know, it, so many of the decisions Mar -a -Lago that followed, Bills. <laughs> right? like he and Rex would have made a perfect match, but who knows if he would have hired Rex. Maybe he would have found a way to keep more. I mean, yeah, it would have it would be a circus covering that team I, as if it isn't enough of a circus <laughs> already. After going through this whole reviewing the sale process, I don't think Trump would have been approved. I really don't. I, do, I don't I, think yeah. owners would have let him in. Yeah. And I think yeah. that bugs him a lot. Yeah. yeah. And I encourage anybody listening, watching this to go check out Tim Graham actually went back on his radio show and played the audio. He still had the audio from those interviews. And now, you know, with the hindsight of him being president and hearing all his interviews, then hearing him interviewing with Tim Graham, it's, it's pretty hilarious the, the way he's talking about. He ba Tim Graham essentially informed Donald Trump that the bills were up for sale. <laughs> and Donald was like, yeah, uh, I'm interested. <laughs> and he said, who do I need to, who do I need to call? It's, it's like... He, Tim Graham has the, <laughs> the future president eating out of the palm of his hand. It, 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 it's really funny. Uh, you got to listen to the audio because the way he talk, the way they're going back and forth, very entertaining. But it's, after you're done with this, though. Yeah. This yeah, 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 yeah. In about an hour and a half because <laughs> 2014 is a lot. Uh, so, okay, fast forward now because we could spend all night on this. The NFL draft, Thursday, May 8th. The Bills have the number ninth overall pick, but not for very long. And I remember sitting in the media room at One Bills Drive and John Morrow shouted out over the whole media room, there's been a trade. <laughs> the Bills have traded the ninth pick, a first rounder and fourth rounder in 2015 to the Cleveland Browns for pick number four. And the Bills draft Sammy Watkins, wide receiver out of Clemson. I remember thinking, oh, they're getting Sammy Watkins. Oh my God, they gave up too much. Yep, yeah, that was, that was the deal. Yep. Because and at the time in that draft, 
as good as the wide receiver market was in that draft, everybody knew it, Sammy Watkins was still seen as the guy of the draft. So, although, yeah, the first round pick was nuts to pay for it. By the way, the only team that has thrown in a future first round pick to get something other than a quarterback since 2000. I had interviews with him, and uh, of course, on every interview, they telling you what you want to hear, how great you is. And uh, at the end of the interview, uh, before I was leaving, uh, Mr. Doug was just kept telling me, uh, do you want to be a Bills? And of course, I'm saying yes. Uh, and then he was like, we're going to get you. We're going to get you. And of course, I'm just throwing out the window like, yeah, yeah. And uh, here we come May 8th. Uh, they jump up four or five four or five spots to get me. They trust and believe in me uh, and put their organization, coaches, job, everything's on the line. So for me, it's uh, be committed to them and uh, come out every day, work hard, uh, be a great citizen, and uh, represent myself, my family, my my college and uh, the organization. I think everybody thought this is the receiver they needed. You know, E.J. Manuel didn't have enough weapons. This was going to be the guy to turn it around. Hopefully they'll forget about the whole first round pick thing. But at the time, that's exactly, I think, what everybody's reaction was. Yeah, I was covering the draft for SB Nation at the time. And I, I'm just studying the draft so closely. I remember when they traded up just thinking that was very dumb. Yep. Um, immediately, like, especially when they grabbed a wide receiver, it was that was very dumb. You could have sat in the second round and grabbed one. I mean, you go back, Odell Beckham. It's amazing. Went, the list. Kelvin oh. Benjamin, uh, Mike Evans. Jarvis Landry, uh, Allen Robinson. Uh, yeah. It was a historically good wide receiver draft on paper before they were drafted, and it still looks really good now. And not to mention, you talk about what ifs. I think a lot of people, including some who covered the team, when they made that trade, thought, oh, Khalil Mack. Mm -hmm. You were going to be the, the guy going forward to Buffalo? That's the thing, man. It was a whole lot of curveballs, and I was like, whoa, what's going on? Cleveland's trading down. I was like, okay. But even then, um, yeah, it's whatever. Yeah, you got to take it as a grain of salt, man, to keep moving, and I'm ready to be Oakland Ray. Buffalo guy, I mean, he's right in your backyard, and they go and get the wide receiver because Doug Whaley has to protect his investment. It, you start going down a weird rabbit hole when you play that game. Meanwhile, Khalil Mack is – maybe the best defensive player on the planet. A and guy that might have excused the extra first round pick. Yeah, people would have, you know, people loved Khalil Mack yep, in Buffalo. They, sure did. they still do. They still follow his every move. If he had been doing what he's doing for the Bills, uh, people would have forgotten about it, especially because the following year, uh, that pick was somewhat late in the first round, bottom half of the 19. first round, 19. Uh, the Browns picked an offensive lineman who's not very good. The center. And yeah, uh, yeah the, it, it, it wasn't that big of a deal. Obviously, you don't want to give up the draft capital. It ended up not being a great player, but uh, if they had gotten Khalil Mack, people might feel differently. And maybe if Sammy turns it around, they'll feel differently, yeah. but very dumb trade yeah. from the start. Yeah, and I, I re you know, remember sitting in the media room at One Bill's Drive, and that was the feeling throughout the room was, Sammy's great, you paid way too much for him. Mm -hmm. you know? So there's, there's the, the number one target for EJ Manuel going into the 2014 season. The following day, and uh, this is a note that just kind of gets scrubbed under because of, of just such a huge trade the night prior, but the Bills trade Stevie Johnson to San Francisco. And you think about the prior years before 2014, Stevie was the team. They, mm -hmm. He was the only player that mattered outside of Western New York, the only player that moved the needle at all, whether both pro, ways. Yeah, yeah, both pro ways. or con. Um, and I just remember, you know, I, I, I've been covering the team for a couple of years at this point, but feeling like, wow, they really just were like, all right, Stevie's gone. Mm -hmm. And I felt that was... I mean, you know, obviously, it's a business and all that stuff, but that I felt was like, oh, Stevie did a bit more for this franchise in his story of being a seventh-round pick and, you know, having three straight thousand-yard seasons. I'm not saying you need to lead the newscast or anything with it, and I'm not saying it's a media thing. I felt like the thought was pervasive throughout Western New York. It was like, okay, well, bye, Stevie. We have, we have Sammy, and I, I just I didn't think that was necessarily fair, Stevie. He was a good receiver. He was a number a number one receiver, yeah. but a lower number receiver. During a really bad era exactly. For the Bills. Yeah. So I don't. I, I think people had maybe tired a little bit of, of some of the. I don't want to say antics because you know Stevie never really came off as a prima donna type guy. He was just kind of a knucklehead. You know, he yeah. just did some dumb stuff yeah. that that bothered you know fans and coaches and got him into trouble and got him suspended here and there. So I, I think the other part of it too is you spend two first round picks. There's a large portion of the fan base that's going to get behind whatever the team does, no matter how dumb it may be to those of us who follow it. And you put two first-round picks into a receiver, I think someone's going to have to be pushed aside and no one minds because we're all excited about Sammy Watkins. Give me a 14 jersey. Yeah, and Stevie Johnson was still reasonably productive mm -hmm. after leaving Buffalo. It, I, you have to wonder 
how much they were thinking about who they wanted to surround Sammy with in the wide receiver room and you know whether Stevie Johnson was that guy I tend to think of it as you know Mike Williams was the guy they ended up bringing in. I was about in. to say, yeah. And so <laughs> they didn't get maybe they the weren't department. maybe yeah. they weren't thinking yeah. too much about that. But you're right. When you give up that much to get a wide receiver, not only is the fan base going to get behind that guy, they're going to want you to throw him the ball. Yeah, and that became an issue for sure in 2014 and beyond. Uh, their second round pick, the brother of Ari Kwanjo, Cyrus Kwanjo. Um, Matt, you have, you know know a lot about scouting and have done a lot of work with the draft. Your thoughts of uh, Cyrus Quanjo, a man who has had a, a torn an ACL and torn MCL, who's had a, a rising red flags throughout the NFL, and uh, he is the Bills' second round pick at pick 44. A guy with first round talent, but had dropped in the second round. Yeah, he dropped for a few reasons. First of all, he played very poorly in his bowl game. He got beat repeatedly by Oklahoma defensive end, can't remember his name, undersized guy, was just beating him off the edge, and that threw up some red flags. He started to fall, but then at the combine, you know, he's flagged for the knee, and, you know, there's reports coming out that it may be an arthritic condition, and it's never going to go away. We didn't think we'd have a chance to get him at our pick in the second round, so we were very ecstatic. We expect him to be contributing early. Opening day, not sure. I, I can't put a timetable on it. It depends on how he comes in, grasps the offense. But your first and second round picks have to contribute early and even your third. But uh, that, that's the way we uh, attack the draft. And I remember when I got to training camp asking him about it, and he was borderline offended that I would, <laughs> you know, because I asked him how his knee was feeling. And he, he seemed offended by it. But it was something I always kept in the back of my mind that this is something they brought up pre-draft. And I remember they even – eventually took him off the injury report with it at one point because they were just like, yeah, this is just a, something he has that he has to deal with. And it prevented him from getting onto the field very much at all. Yeah. He, and that first camp, he got beat out by seventh round pick, Sean Charles Henderson. So he had every opportunity to earn a job because Cordy Glenn was, was fighting through uh, you know, a medical condition at the time. And he just never stepped up. And I think a lot of it had to do with health and a lot of it probably had to do with him maybe not being quite as good as, you know, you see a guy four-year starter or whatever he was for Alabama. The more games you play at Alabama, the better your draft stock gets. But uh, he just never had it. Yeah, and uh, I think about, you know, to, to your point about Alabama, you know, obviously since Nick Saban has taken over, they've become the best number one full stop, you know, team in college football. But they send a lot of prospects to the pros that are damaged goods. And, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend like I know every prospect that's gone to the NFL from Bama th throughout the Saban era. But Quanjo to me, was like, yeah, there were red flags. I mean, it was discussed that night. You know, they asked Doug Whaley, like, hey, there are red flags about this guy. And, oh, no, 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 we've cleared it with our, our medical staff. And, and, you know, I just that you hear Alabama second round pick like, oh, this guy's got to be good. But he never produced. And, and then in the third round, the Bills draft Preston Brown, linebacker out of Louisville. And then just to fly through the rest of the 14 draft class, fourth round, Ross Cockrell. Uh, Cyril, Be best player in the draft, maybe. I know, right? Sammy Watkins. Yeah, Cyril Richardson uh, goes in the fifth round, Randall Johnson in the seventh, and then Chantrell Henderson pick 237. A guy who had first round talent was seen as one of the best prospects coming out of high school. But uh, man liked to smoke weed. <laughs> and uh, it, it took him down uh, in draft boards uh, across the NFL. Failed two drug tests at Miami. Then failed one at the Combine. How do you mm. fail a drug test at the Combine, man? Yeah. You know it's coming. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so Chantrell mm. Henderson drops to 237. So Willie says he's going to give him one shot, too, and I think he had plenty more than one shot. Now, some of the, the marijuana use wasn't, like, uh, irresponsible. There's definitely been questions about Crohn's disease and all that. But, you know, Doug Willie said he's got one chance. And, boy, he got way more than one chance. Although, he, for a while there, he was behaving. And, and playing well. And playing well. And it wasn't until later on that, you know, they had to cut him some slack because uh, of the illness he was fighting through. But I just remember it, it was very funny the types of players that Doug Marone gravitated to. And he really liked Chantrell Henderson. And the, the offensive line coach at the time really liked Chantrell. And I think they liked him better than Quanjo. I mean, it showed because <laughs> yeah. he played yeah. a lot. And he played pretty well. Uh, I, he's a guy that, you know, you follow through college and, and I, he was, I was kind of pulling for him because he had an odd underdog story after like falling from the mountaintop basically. And he had all this talent. He's a, he's a goofy guy and he's gotten himself into some trouble, but he's still hanging around. He's still yeah, on yes. the roster, which yeah. is more than you can say about Such most one. of that draft. Yeah, about Randall Johnson, <laughs> Cyril Richardson, <laughs> Ross Cockrell. Yeah. 
Uh, so, and a, and a quick update on the sale through the month of May. Jerry Jones at the owners' meeting glows over Bon Jovi in Toronto. Just yeah. says how great they are. So you, you go, oh great, that's that's just wonderful news. Maybe the worst moment of the, that whole era was yeah. when you, that was probably the only time you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. Come on, Jerry. You yeah. Know, Jera. <laughs> Tom Golisano throws his hat into the ring, says he's going to be interested in, in bidding on the Bills, and Trump said he'd use his own money to build a stadium for the Buffalo Bills. Okay then, Donald. Monday, May 5th, uh, th here comes a period, uh, you talk about guys that Marone has gravitated to, and this is a, a player brought into the Bills pre Marone and pre Doug Whaley for that matter, but uh, a, a guy who had his own issues off the field to say the least. Marcel Darius arrested in Alabama for felony possession of a controlled substance found uh, with synthetic weed after stop for speeding. Then uh, three weeks later at OTAs, Marcel Darius says, I'm not a trouble guy. It's not what you think. Marcel Darius is here. Earlier this month, he was arrested on drug charges in Alabama. His teammates are standing by him. Marcel and I talk all the time. You know, what, what we talk about, well, obviously, it'll stay between us. Um, but, I, I, you know, I think Marcel you know, wants to do the right thing, and I think he will do the right thing. They, they know that I'm not a trouble guy. They, they, they know that I'm, I'm not the person that's trying to look for any, any trouble, not trying to do anything wrong. Just things happen, and I'm, we're moving forward, and they know I'm, I'm going to grow into the guy they want me to be. Two days later, Marcel Darius is arrested, charged with reckless endangerment, reckless driving, participating in an illegal speed contest as he was drag racing in Hamburg, allegedly uh, with Jerry Hughes. And this is right at the time as, as you uh, come into the fold in western New York, and your thoughts being dropped in and seeing a, a number three overall pick, a former number three overall pick, getting arrested twice in one month. Yeah, it was funny. It was during my interview, they asked me, you know, because that was the story of the week while I was getting interviewed for the job. And they asked me, you know, how would you handle this story and stuff? So that was one that I was kind of plugged into. And I still, I, I can't even count how many times I drove by the Mongolian buffet in Hamburg <laughs> where they crashed. I mean, it, the irony of it all and how it all played out of you know hours after you the next day he's uh you know after he's saying this isn't what you think i'm i'm a good guy and it just goes to show you jerry hughes was involved there too you know maybe that he didn't have the best influences around him in the locker room but come to think of like everything else that marcel darius has been through in the last few years yeah. it's like well that was kind of just a minor blip on the radar but it was something that we were still covering, you know, a year after the fact as he was going through the, the court system trying to get that thing cleaned up. Yeah, the Marcel Darius story is, I mean, his life story is, is incredible. Just the, the, the tragedies that he's had to overcome, yet also at the same time doing things you go like, don't drag race. Like, that's pretty, right. <laughs> yeah. you know, like, that's, that's not like, a, oh, he's a good guy or a bad guy. Like, no, you don't do that. I, I know that my thoughts on Darius have, have definitely swung back and forth throughout the years because... I think this is a guy that does care, but at the same time, you know, he's had to deal with death. You know, so many people in his life have passed away uh, for murder or for other causes. And, you know, then at the same time, he does things like this mm. where you go, well, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, don't be a knucklehead. And this was a bad six-month period because he was coming off the, the late to the meeting suspension from yeah, the end of the last too. season. Yeah. And that was in right in December. So, you, you know, you've got a, a guy that the Bills were counting on, had counted on spending a, a third overall pick on him. He was due for money in the relative near future. And, and he just could not get out of his own way. Again, he had a million inner demons too. But at this point in May, you know, he was six months removed from being suspended for the team. He gets arrested. He says, this is not me. He gets arrested again. It was hard not to look at him and wonder if he was ever going to figure it out. Yeah, for sure. And I then, don't know uh, if you've driven by that where I he, have not. I, to be honest, no. I have not been to that Mongo. Uh, I want to spend you, a lot of time in Hamburg. So. You ought to drive by. Is there it, a plaque? It, well, <laughs> I, I remember most, the, the, like, a, like a hole in one or something. Yeah. The first time I went by, I thought, oh my God, he was drag racing here. It's a busy spot where I can't even, I don't know how fast he was going. I yeah. forget if they no, I, got a number on it, but I'm like, this is not a good, of all places to drag race. <laughs> I'm not an expert on the matter. I, I could think I've of never drag wrong. raced yeah. myself, but that's yeah. a pretty bad one. But you can think of places uh, near the stadium. I mean, right. park, like, I'd go there, right. I'd go there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not that I've never done it either. No, but of yeah. course not. Yeah. No, of course not. We are, all three of us are very, Responsible. Well, I'm, I'm not going to say that about myself. I've never <laughs> drag raced. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Thursday, or the, the, right in, on the heels of that, Marcel Darius is uh, dismissed from OTAs. Marone says, you just, just go home, take care of what, yeah. whatever you need to take care of. I'm disappointed in all of our players anytime any of one of us, including myself, when we make poor decisions. 
and and you know it's a reflection of of of, of the team, which is a reflection of me, and it's a reflection on this organization. Well, Marcel's a very smart person. Uh, Marcel's his own man. He's a grown man as well, so uh, he's going to make the decisions he wants to make. You know, he's still young. We're all young. You know, we all make mistakes, and uh, you know, I'm just thankful that he didn't get hurt to the point where he couldn't you know redeem himself. Everybody has their own demons and everything, but some people you know work through it differently than others. Um, with him, you know, he's come. He has a long history of of just being kind of alone. You know, he likes to be baby on himself. He likes to kind of keep himself away from situations, and he knows he doesn't want to carry his teammates down. The, the Marcel that y'all see in the paper is not the Marcel we know on the field or even outside the football. The whole the whole character thing is just it's getting blown out of proportion. My job is to win, and winning is important, but it's not as important as trying to help somebody. All right, I'd rather you know lose games. And, and do the right thing. I can live with myself. And then on, uh, on June 12th, dipping back into the bill sale, on the heels of selling $1.75 billion of West Virginia drilling acreage, reports emerged that one Terrence Pagula has high interest in buying the bills. And obviously he owns the Sabres at this point, and the narrative had been simmering for months at this point. And uh, okay. Now, now here the, the, the lifesaver is here for the Buffalo Bills, a guy who has nearly $2 billion just in his pocket, and it's Terry and Kim Pagula. Yeah, this was, this was the way it was received, too, right off the bat, mm -hmm. because he checked all the boxes. It was already owned the hockey team, you know, had an interest in Buffalo. There was already thought that maybe even before there was a bill sale to be had that he might have interest, as we talked about a couple of podcasts, a couple of broadcasts ago, that... Uh, he was asked about it from the moment he took over as the Sabres owner. So this was the, and he even bristled at the notion that he was a savior, but that's what we all thought. This was the guy. Yeah, and I, that's why I say as crazy as that summer was, it felt like behind the scenes after the fact, when you hear all the stories, it, it was crazy. There were, you know, sideshows, but for the most part, it made sense to everybody outside, and it obviously made sense to everybody inside. As soon as Terry and Kim Pagula showed that strong interest. That's where yeah. they weren't going to be outbid. As nope. you mentioned, he had a ton of cash on hand and, you know, was worth even more than that. And he already owned the, the Sabres in town. I, it just felt like all along, like yeah. maybe we were all distracted yeah. and behind the scenes, <laughs> yeah. they were just pushing things along <laughs> and this was a formality, but there was just it, it wasn't over no. as soon as Terry showed interest, that's for sure. And then a week later, uh, the sales process is officially underway for, for prospective buyers. Trump tweets, to your point, he's the only potential owner committed to keeping the bills in western New York, mm -hmm. to which the governor, Mario Cuomo, laughed it off. Yeah. And so, yeah, there you go, Trump. Learned a whole lot about billion-dollar finance that year. Yeah, you know, about really how, how bidding works and, you know, <laughs> the first bid, Invested initial bids, and... bills of sale, all that stuff, yeah. Tuesday, July 1st, I remember this day as well, uh, finding out from the Bills that Kiko Alonso has torn his ACL while working out and will likely miss the 2014 season. The legend of Kiko Alonso took a huge hit that night. That was the beginning of maybe an 18-month period where, you know, when you got a text on your phone that said Doug Whaley has a statement, you're like, oh, what do they do now? I yeah. mean, it was, you know, it was Kiko this time, and, you know, it was disappointing. He had, you know, he had had a very good rookie season, but most of us kind of looked at it and said it was very good for about eight to ten games. And then it tailed off to where you were like, I don't know if this guy's going to stick in the league. It, so it wasn't, it wasn't the end of the world in terms of an injury, but uh, it certainly didn't help. And coming out of nowhere, you know, not at a team facility, not during a practice, just at a random workout, always looked bad. Yeah, I remember that as my first day on the job. No kidding. <laughs> there you I go. I got to Orchard Park, started un unloading stuff into my apartment. Had no internet, had no bed, had, <laughs> I had like no furniture, and I got the text. I was like, "Well, I'm set up on the system, so that's good." And I was like, but now I have to work. You have my email address. Here we go. Now. Yeah, and uh, that was, I, I mean, that's a tough blow. But they did draft Preston Brown, so they were kind of prepared for it. And like you, I kind of thought, for all the the sizzle early in the year, late in the year, you started to wonder whether Kiko Alonso was as much of a stud as he looked like early on. So not the best news any team ever gets on July 1st, but uh, you know something they were somewhat well prepared to, to move on from. The end of the month, there's some good news for the Buffalo Bills as the initial bids are due. Toronto, Trump, Pagula, Galasano expected to, bill, uh, to bid on the Bills. And uh, word comes out that Pagula's first bid is for $1.3 billion. So Toronto, 
try and call that amount of cash. By this time, we were hard into, we think this is going to go Pagula's way. And if not just Pagula's way, it's going to be a, a bid that's going to keep the bills in Buffalo. So, uh, you know, once you get to like training camp, I think I felt like the, the sale was going to be a thing that was going to keep the bills in Buffalo, which is the only thing that mattered. Yeah. Whoever the name was that was going to sign the checks, it didn't matter. As long as those checks are going to be handed out in Buffalo, that's all that people look for. Now, the Bills, speaking of training camp, have an early training camp in 2014 because they're in the Hall of Fame game because one Andre Reid is inducted. Almost a, a million kids that play football every year, all the way from Pop Warner to the NFL. And then if you look at the 95 years of the league, 25,000, 30,000 guys have come through the league. Only 287 get a jacket, a bus, and a ring. And get to sit in that room that I was in earlier. It's pretty overwhelming. And he receives his gold jacket, and in a 35-minute speech, the biggest ovation, there were several ovations, but the ovation that got the, the hairs in the back of my neck standing up was just in the middle, he just goes, Oh yeah, and the Bills will stay in Buffalo too. And the crowd just goes bananas. And, you know, Thad, you were in Canton that weekend, just, you know, taking that all in and being there at the Hall of Fame. Just walk me through that. The first time, you know, for all the bills that had gone and the time I've worked here, it was the first time I actually got to go down for, you know, that weekend. And the funny thing was, that Andre, it was all about him as it should be prior to, because the, the media availability is prior, a day prior to the speech. And then, you know, we got the game with, with Sammy Watkins and there's things going on there. But the Andre Reid stuff was about his career and finally getting in because it took him eight times to get into the Hall of Fame. And there wasn't really much discussion. There was some about keeping the Bills in Buffalo. You know what I do remember about that part of it was you couldn't walk 15 feet in Canton without seeing a sign that said, I hate John Bon Jovi or don't play his record or something <laughs> like that. But Andre Reid himself really didn't, didn't talk about it a whole lot. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the speech, bang! You know, and, and that was um, the highlight of that speech for sure. Yeah, and you could feel it too the amount of Bills fans that yeah. were there. He had a lot of support and you felt it when he said that and the place went crazy and there was, and Jim Kelly was there that mm -hmm. weekend as well, which was also a pretty big deal. Obviously people following along with what he was doing. And I think a lot of people, you know, wanted Andre to get that recognition that he was sort of the one left out uh, of the, the big group that got them to all those Super Bowls. And so, that was a pretty cool weekend for a lot of people that, that made the trip. Yeah, and then at the end of, uh, of Reed's speech, you know, he, he mentions the, the 12 plus 83 all, always equals six, and, and Kelly comes out with a football and he throws him one last pass, and that got a huge pop from the crowd. And, you know, you mentioned how many Bills fans were there. Michael Strahan is inducted to the Hall of Fame the same yes. day. Yeah. And yet, at the same time, as Reed makes this speech, it feels like Orchard Park has moved mm -hmm. to Canton, Ohio. And it just goes to show you how much Reed and that Bills team of the, the early 90s, and of course Jim Kelly too, just how much it meant to so many people. And that moment, I just is something that has stuck with me for a long time. And then the following day, Jim Kelly participates in the coin toss, and both teams are you know going crazy with their Hall of Famers out in the mm -hmm. field. Um, just that, that celebration of football, of Kelly, Strahan, Reed, all these guys that are on the field uh, pregame, just how neat was that? It's, it's, you know, once in a lifetime kind of thing, you know, especially just going to the Hall of Fame. I'd never been there either, you know, just walking through and, and seeing, seeing the Kelly bus and the Thurman bus and all that stuff. Um, and, but to have Jim on the field and to have him, you know, by that point, you know, he had more or less put the cancer in the rearview mirror. Um, and that was kind of a confirmation of it, that there's Jim, there's him flipping the coin. You know, he's, he's more or less the same gregarious self. It was a good moment. Again, for a whole offseason that had been cloudy at best, this was, you know, a very positive feel-good moment for Bills fans. You know, just a couple months ago, Jim Kelly lay in a hospital bed uncertain of his future. The, the fact he made it here to be part of the coin toss is something he will never forget. That was awesome. I mean, anytime you're picked to do that, even with Harry Carson, another Hall of Famer, uh, it's awesome. Considering what you've been through the last several months and to be here now, to feel the love from the fans, the players, tell me about it. You know what, it's, it's really hard to explain because uh, the feelings that go through you because there's so many memories of great times in Buffalo and then of course having Andre go in, uh, it's, it's something that's really hard to describe, but uh, I'm just glad I'm here. Where else would you rather be than right here, right now? So Wednesday, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, August 13th and 14th, the Bills uh, are practicing in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. And this Good might times. be the highlight of the EJ Manuel experience in Buffalo. I remember that second practice when EJ Manuel looked like everything we thought he'd be, or at least everything the Bills thought he'd be. 
Um, and uh, I know, Matt, you and I were both down there in Latrobe. Manuel was accurate. He was decisive. He made right decisions. And, uh, you know, there's no a box score for a practice. So guys are jotting down completions. And, like, I, was he 18 of 21, 18 <laughs> of 20? Right. And uh, I just think, like, tweeting about updates about how well Jim Kelly, or uh, Jim Kelly, EJ Manuel, if only. Easy um, to mistake the two on that. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, just how well EJ Manuel participated in that practice. I, I, I knew, I, I kind of felt it was fool's gold at that time. Obviously, it's August 14th. Uh, but your thoughts in Pennsylvania? Yeah, it was funny because often, you know, Doug Whaley was, you know, thought EJ was going to be their Big Ben, right? He was going to, mm -hmm. you know, be that big, strong arm quarterback who could control the game the way Ben did early in his career. And I remember being in Latrobe, and I still, I was talking to a few guys that cover the team about this recently, thinking that's what a training camp practice looks like when you have a quarterback. The way Big Ben was, you know, orchestrating things for the Steelers, it's a completely different deal when you actually have a quarterback. The Bills still don't have what the Steelers have in Big Ben, but that day that EJ looked that good, it, bouncing back after a pretty bad day the day before was like, man, you know, is the light coming on? Because at the time, he's only a second-year quarterback. That's about the time the light starts to come on for these guys. And he started to look good with a big crowd in an uncomfortable environment. And you're thinking, maybe, maybe he's <laughs> legit. I don't know. I told EJ, man, to be honest, I told him, my exact words, it's the best I've ever seen him. I don't think he uh, incompleted a pass today. Uh, it was, everything was on time. We got everything we wanted. It was like perfect. Coming out our breaks ball right there, uh, just the best I've seen him. And if, if he keep getting like this, it's we're gonna be something to play with. I don't want to make it seem like it was a surprise to come out and practice good. I want to, you know, take each and every day and treat this like a game, especially going against a different defense. But um, like I said, we we don't want to consider this like, oh man, it was a wow, it's a great day. You know, this needs to be a consistent thing. It needs to be like that every day. You know, just another, you know, another good day in the books, and uh, we come back tomorrow with what we need to do and uh, be prepared for the game on Saturday. You know, to your point, you know, I'm keeping the box score by hand. And you flip back in the, the pages and you got the previous day's box scores, all the box scores from St. John Fisher, and you're like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pump the brakes yeah, just, just for a second and, and see where this goes, and it didn't go anywhere. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I just remember being like, is, this isn't really happening. And, and, like, the light's not really turning on. We know who E.J. Manuel is. Mm. He's the guy that's throwing it into the corporate Ooh. tent. He's the guy that's, <laughs> you know, that's... That, that's running around like, like a chicken with his head cut off when there's pressure in the backfield. Um, but uh, the, the bright times continue for the Buffalo Bills at the end of camp. Wednesday, August 20th, doctors say no evidence can of cancer remaining for Jim Kelly. And then on Thursday, September 4th, Kelly biopsy results come back neg negative. Kelly tough. Jim Kelly is cancer free. And, you know, there are a lot of moments, a lot of sighs of relief for Bills fans and for this region that come pretty much from September 4th through the middle of October. It's just kind of like one right after the other. And I remember this was the first one, and you got that news that Kelly was cancer-free, and people, you know, kind of like when Reed said, the, oh, yeah, the Bills are staying in Buffalo, this was another moment where people just went bananas, especially on social media, where you can see everyone's reaction. Mm -hmm. I remember when uh, he got back into town, there was a small greeting for him. It wasn't very big, maybe a couple hundred people, but people were just jacked. And he was, as we talked about earlier, you know, in, in this hour, that – he wasn't a big fan of having anything chronicled at first. I think when he saw this reaction, even from a not monstrous group, this is when he realized, wow, you know, this is this had an effect on everyone. And now that I'm healthy, everybody's happy. And, and he felt that he, the look on his face was something I will never forget. Yeah, that was that was a great moment because more, even more so than the team team's future hanging in the balance, things did not look good for Jim as we talked about, and for him to bounce back the way he did. And it seemed like things just got better and better for him throughout the summer. Obviously, he was at Andre Reed's Hall of Fame induction. And that moment was sort of the, the culmination of that. You knew he wasn't totally out of the woods. You, nobody ever is after going through what he did. But you could see the impact it had on the community. It was pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I, I remember that. And, and then seeing not only in Western New York, but uh, the places where you know, he's touched, uh, you know, Miami had a green out, the, the University of Miami. And, you know, Kelly Tuff was all over Dolphin Stadium uh, down in Florida. And, you know, seeing John Elway send out, you know, congratulations and, you know, well done, Jim. And, you know, everyone was pulling for him. But you, you, knew, you knew how big Jim Kelly was. That was no surprise. But just to see that outpouring of support I, I was, is something that has stuck with me as well.